welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll take what we've learned about Lagrangian mechanics and apply it to the two-body central force system. It's not necessary to use Lagrangian or Hamiltonian mechanics to solve for the dynamics of these systems. This is a beautiful simulation by Yevgeny Numerzichki that uses a Newtonian integrator to display the dynamics of a small solar system, much like we did for the Leonard Jones gas. However, we'll find that by using Lagrangian and Hamiltonian techniques will let us further simplify these systems and introduce some novel phenomena. We'll start by setting up the geometry of this system. We have two particles, one of mass m1 located at a position r1 from the origin, and the other has mass m2 and is located at some position r2 from the origin. They're separated by the vector r1 minus r2. A central force is a force that depends only on the distance between the two bodies. Therefore, the potential only depends on the magnitude of the vector r1 minus r2. Examples of this are the gravitational force and the Coulomb force. In these coordinates, the Lagrangian is given by 1 half m1 r1 dot squared plus 1 half m2 r2 dot squared minus the potential energy. Remember, we're free to choose any coordinates that we'd like with Lagrangian systems. So perhaps another set of coordinates would be better. Let's try the separation between these two particles r as one of our coordinates and the center of mass of the two particles rcm as the other coordinate. One nice thing about these coordinates is that they no longer depend on our choice of origin. The center of mass is given by the weighted average of the positions of the particles. It's equal to m1 times r1 plus m2 times r2 divided by the total mass, which we're going to call big M. We'd like to rewrite the Lagrangian in terms of these new coordinates. The potential energy is already a function of these coordinates, as it depends only on the magnitude of the relative positions r. To find the kinetic energy, we can rewrite our positions r1 and r2 in terms of our new coordinates r and rcm. r1 is equal to rcm plus m2 divided by the total mass times the relative position r, and r2 is equal to rcm minus m1 divided by the total mass times the relative position r. Then we'll use these definitions to rewrite the kinetic energy, which was 1 half m1 r1 dot squared plus 1 half m2 r2 dot squared as 1 half m1 times rcm dot plus m2 divided by the total mass times r dot quantity squared plus 1 half m2 times rcm dot minus m1 over the total mass times r dot quantity squared. When we expand this out, we end up with 1 half the total mass times rcm dot squared plus 1 half m1 times m2 divided by the total mass m times r dot squared plus cross terms, but the cross terms cancel out. This term here, m1 m2 divided by the total mass shows up a lot, so we're going to call it mu, which is the reduced mass. In these new coordinates, the Lagrangian is much simpler. It's given by 1 half the total mass times rcm squared plus 1 half the reduced mass times r dot squared minus the potential energy, which depends only on the magnitude of r. This looks like the Lagrangian for two isolated particles. The first particle has mass big M and it's moving at some constant velocity in the rcm direction. The second particle has mass mu and it's moving in some potential u according to the coordinate r. Our Lagrangian is just the Lagrangian for the center of mass plus the reduced Lagrangian. We call it the reduced Lagrangian because mu is the reduced mass. The Euler-Lagrange equation for LCM is trivial. DLCM by DRCM is equal to zero, which implies that DL by DRCM dot is equal to some constant. This means that RCM is an ignorable coordinate and we don't need to consider it in any of our further calculations. Then the Euler-Lagrange equation for a reduced Lagrangian is given by dl reduced by dr minus d by dt of dl reduced by dr dot equals zero. We can write this out as minus the gradient of u minus d by dt of mu r dot is equal to zero. 
or equivalently, mu r double dot is equal to minus the gradient of u. And this is the equation of motion for our reduced system. We've now reduced the dimensionality of the problem from a six-dimensional problem, where we have three components of R1 and three components for R2, to a three-dimensional system where we only have three components of the vector R. We're going to see in a minute that we can actually reduce this problem down to a 1D system. This type of coordinate reduction is related to the symmetries of the problem. This is a poster by Katayoun Movasegi when they were a master's student at the University of Toronto Scarsborough. Here they're using the two-body central force problem as an example of how symmetries, in particular the Hamiltonian formalism, can lead to reduced dimensionality. Keep this in mind as we'll be returning to these ideas in a later video. We've showed that RCM is an ignorable coordinate, which means that the center of mass can't accelerate. So we can choose an inertial coordinate system where the center of mass is at its origin and its velocity is equal to zero. In this coordinate system, the position of M1 is given by R1, which is equal to M2 over the total mass times the relative position R, and mass M2 is located at minus M1 divided by the total mass times the relative position R. These particles have velocities V1 and V2 respectively. Then in this coordinate system, the Lagrangian is merely the reduced Lagrangian, which is equal to 1 half mu r dot squared minus the potential energy as a function of r. In this type of system, symmetry dictates that all the motion must be planar. This means that the plane spanned by r1 v1 is the same plane that's spanned by r2 v2. The dynamics, then, are always going to lie within this plane. So all we need is two dimensions to describe the entire system. In two dimensions, we can write our relative position in polar coordinates, r cosine theta and r sine theta, where r dot squared is equal to r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared. Our Lagrangian in these coordinates is 1 half mu times r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared minus u as a function of r. You'll notice that the transformation theta goes to delta theta leaves the Lagrangian unchanged because theta dot is the same either way. So according to Noether's theorem, dl by d theta dot is our conserved momentum, which is equal to mu r squared theta dot. Turns out that this quantity is just angular momentum. We can see this by writing angular momentum as the moment of inertia, which is equal to mu r squared times omega, which is just equal to theta dot. That means that the angular momentum, which I'm going to call little l, is conserved in the system. And we'll be using this definition of angular momentum many times in the next few videos. Since theta is an ignorable coordinate, we only need to consider the evolution of the r coordinate. This is given by the Euler-Lagrange equation dl by dr minus d by dt of dl by dr dot equals zero, which equals du by dr plus mu theta dot squared minus mu r double dot is equal to zero. I can make this simpler by using the definition of angular momentum to remove the theta dot term. And I get du by dr plus L squared over mu r cubed minus mu r double dot is equal to zero. So our original six dimensional system is now entirely determined by this one equation for the variable r. This equation says that the force in the r direction mu r double dot is equal to L squared over mu r cubed minus du by dr. Let me re-express this term so that it looks like the derivative of something. That is d by dr of minus L squared over 2 mu r squared. Then I'll combine these two derivatives to show that the force in the r direction mu r double dot is equal to minus d by dr of L squared over 2 mu r squared plus u of r. We'll call this our effective potential. This term acts like an additional potential that our particle moves through. It's like the fictitious centrifugal potential you feel in an inverted roller coaster. What does this potential look like? Forces like gravitation or the Coulomb force have potentials that go like minus one over r, and our centrifugal potential goes like one over r squared. When we add these together, we get an effective potential that looks like this. 
This is great news because we have a minimum in our potential that causes lots of interesting behavior that we'll see in the next video. Before we move on with this analogy, we'd like to double check that energy is still conserved in this new coordinate system. Starting with the equation of motion, mu r double dot is equal to minus d by dr of our effective potential. I'm going to multiply both sides by r dot and then integrate this over time. On the left hand side, I have one half mu r dot squared, which looks like our kinetic energy. And on the right side, I have the integral of minus d by dr of u effective times r dot dt. We can use the chain rule to write d by dr as d by dt times 1 over dr by dt. Then 1 over dr by dt and r dot cancel out. And what I'm left with is the integral of minus d by dt of u effective dt. And this integrates to minus u effective plus some constant of integration c. This tells me that one half mu r dot squared plus u effective is equal to a constant. So yes, in fact, energy is conserved in this system. In the next video, we'll explore inverse square law forces like gravitation and electrostatics and find the orbits that these systems make. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.